Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today, I wanted to dedicate an episode on bilocation. Now, bilocation is different than astral projection. It is a very unique phenomenon that has been documented in a variety of spiritual circles. One of the earliest references to bilocation is in the classic an autobiography of a yogi in which Paramahansa Yogananda encounters his guru who has bilocated from the actual location that he exists upon. Recently, I had an experience in which somebody told me they saw me in another place and that I spoke with them and I was not in the, that place at all, even in that town at that time. I found this fascinating because I do not remember it. And so I questioned whether or not I was conscious when this happened, or perhaps there was some sort of time loop where I actually found myself in this place. I've had people comment or email me that of course they've seen me in dreams and that may be a form of bilocation. But I've also had people say that they've seen me during the day at different times. Perhaps it's because my bald head and I'm very familiar, but this is something that's encountered often. Cynthia Sue Larson, the amazing writer of the book on quantum jumping also documents her experiences with bilocation saying that people have seen her on the beach when she was sitting at home. And it's interesting when you go back and look at many of the mystics and saints, there are these similar reports of some sort of bilocation occurring. And I believe in the fourth density environment of the new earth as the fourth density photon becomes more complicated one of the complexities of this is bilocation, that you will be able to exist in multiple places at the same time. And there's some amazing research and discussions that have gone on for many years. One of the best I recommend is a book by Edmund Gurney and Frederick Meyer called Phantasms of the Living, in which way back in the 1800s, they documented this by asking people to talk about seeing human entities that didn't appear to actually be there. And there were many reports of bilocation, people actually touching the person in some cases, or hearing them auditorily, or just simply seeing them. And there is something to this. It is an absolutely real thing. There is science behind it, which I will discuss later on this, but I wanted to learn more about it. And if I could be conscious in two bodies at the same time, I want to learn how to do that. And I want to learn what it means to be in bilocation. So I've sort of put together some research on this. In the book, The Mystery of the Human Double by Ralph Shirley, he says, on another occasion, another member of the house, Dr. Mark McDonald was seen by fellow members on two consecutive days and actually recorded his vote in the division lobby. Though as a matter of fact, he had not left his room being laid up at the time. The term bilocation means the ability to be in two places at the same time. The phenomenon entails, in other words, a replication of the human form, the two portions of which may become widely separated from one another, so that the copy is sometimes able to visit distant regions into which it is somehow projected and from which it later supernaturally disappears. The created double can, of course, be seen by others and frequently both speaks in a voice and performs actions identical to those of the real person. The clothes it wears are likewise replicas of the originals. We even see reference to this in Neville Goddard when he visits his sister as his sister's son is dying and she sees him in the bed. This is an example of bilocation that we have discussed in the Neville Goddard material. And what does it mean? Are we experiencing bilocation from people that are dreaming? People who have seen a double frequently testify that although it often has an unhealthy pallor, it cannot be otherwise distinguished from the real individual and indeed it is thought to be that person until it either vanishes before their eyes or the subject gives proof that he or she was in another place when the visitation occurred. However, the evidence suggests that the double or alter ego is not a full physical replica of the person concerned, but rather a formed of material that while genuine enough to the eye lacks the intrinsic solidity and permanence of normal matter. This is no doubt why the double can only exist for a relatively short time and hence cannot take up 
an independent existence of its own. Bilocation most often occurs when the subject is in trance. One brought on by meditation or by contemplation, which may explain why the phenomenon is typically associated with saints and hermits, lamas and other holy men and women, although these are by no means the only ones to whom it happens. A trance state also allows the consciousness of the person replicated to be transferred to the double, thereby enabling it to function as if it really was that person. But when duplication happens to someone who is conscious, such a mind shift cannot normally take place, which result in a lack of self-awareness and an inability to cogitate by the alter ego. Bilocation is one of the many miracles said to have been performed by St. Anthony of Padua. This Portuguese Franciscan monk, who was renowned for his learning and for his skill as a preacher, which was sublime enough to convert criminals and heretics, was conducting a service on Holy Thursday, 1226, at the Church of St. Pierre de Querix in Lamoges, where he suddenly realized that he had promised to attend the service at the monastery chapel on the other side of town. He gathered his thoughts, knelt down, and pulled the hood of his habit over the head, then prayed and remained motionless for some time. After the service was over, word came that he had indeed been at the chapel, his double having miraculously appeared there in this form. He read the lesson and the appointed office, then disappeared to the astonishment and wonder of the congregation of monks. Another isolated bilocation was reported of St. Alphonsus Liguori, 1697-1787. The Italian theologian and founder of the Redemptorists, a group of priests who carried out missionary work in rural areas, he was made bishop of the Diocese of St. Agata de Godi in 1762, which while small in size gave him continual administrative and congregational problems, these contributing to the ill health he experienced during the last 20 years of his life. In 1774, during one period of sickness which was aggravated by his habit of fasting, St. Alphonsus remained in his cell for five days in a coma-like trance. When he eventually recovered, he told his aides that he had been present at the deathbed of Pope Clement XIV in Rome, a journey of some four days away. They, of course, looked somewhat askance at this, assuming that he must have been suffering from delusions. Yet word eventually came from Rome that he had been seen by witnesses among the crowd of mourners, standing around the dying Pope's bedside, some of whom had both touched and spoken with him. Such duplication is also said to have happened to several other Catholic saints, including St. Ambrose, St. Severus of Ravenna, St. Clement of Rome, and St. Francis Xavier. Yet while these individual bilocations are certainly remarkable, they cannot compare with those accomplished by the Venerable Mary of Jesus of Agrida, the Spanish nun whose duplicate form repeatedly materialized before hundreds of witness on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean over 2,000 miles away. Mary Coronel was born at Agrida in Castile, Spain on 2 April 1602. The eldest of two surviving daughters born to Francisco and Catalina de Arana Coronel, she was evidently a sensitive and religiously precocious child who suffered much from various ailments, some doubtless psychological in nature, and from the strict upbringing imposed on her by her parents. From time to time she heard disembodied voices addressing her, one of which spoke with some regularly after her mother had made a small oratory for her. She called for the voice of her pole star, and one day it said to her, My spouse, turn thyself to me, and forsake that which is earthly and momentary. Rise up, my dove, and flee to me. This heavenly command prompted the young Mary to make a vow that she would become a nun, which she did by entering the Agrita convent. In 1620, during one of her ecstatic trances or raptures, Mary had a vision of all the people of the world, and she noted with dismay that very few of them were Roman Catholics, her attention being particularly taken by the heathen Jumano Indians of Mexico, an area which had recently been colonized by Spain. Her concern for them led her to pray fervently for their conversion, little realizing that she herself would be responsible for it, 
for not long afterwards. According to Michael Geddes, one of her early biographers, she had another rapture in which she found herself in a new region and in a different climate and amidst those very Indians she prayed for so particularly. She did very sensibly perceive the great heat of that climate and observed all its other diversities. She was then commanded to pour out her charity on the Indians. She had prayed for so much. By preaching the Christian faith to them, Mary did so, and though she spoke to them in Spanish, she was perfectly understood by them, and so was their language by her. When she came out of her rapture, she found herself in the same place it had seized her in. This was the first of approximately 500 bilocations that Mary underwent between 1620 and 1631. When she did convert the king of that vast country and all his subjects, which were numberless to the Christian faith, for she did not, as perhaps might at first be thought, vanish from Magrita and materialize in Mexico, but rather her normal self remained in Agrita in an ecstatic trance, as was testified by her fellow nuns. While her duplicate miraculously appeared in that distant country, thereby enabling her to successfully carry out her missionary duties, Mary came among the Jumanos clad in a replica of her blue Franciscan habit. And curiously, on one occasion she was able to take with her and distribute numerous rosaries which had been lying in her cell, which were never seen again afterwards by anyone at the convent. Mary's miraculous appearances and disappearances among the Mexico Indians came to light when, intent on following her instructions to be baptized, a group of Jumanos went to the nearest Franciscan outpost situated over a hundred miles away and asked the friars to return with them and perform this important and much desired task. The friars were naturally amazed to discover that the Jumanos had a knowledge of Christianity let alone the deep understanding which they revealed, and their amazement turned to wonder when having inquired of the Jumanos, who had brought the word of Christ to them, they were informed that it was brought by a woman. But they could not tell who she was nor from whence she came, but they gave an account of the clothes she wore and her countenance. The friars perceived plainly that her clothes were exactly the habit of the Franciscan nuns, one of them who happened to have a small picture of the mother Luisa de Carrion, a famous Franciscan nun in Spain at that time, for Mary's fame nor picture had not yet reached those remote parts. He showed it to the Indians and asked them whether that was not the woman that had instructed and converted them. They said the habit was exactly the same, but the face was not, for the woman by whom they were taught was both much younger and much handsomer. The friars Superior father, Alonso de Benavides, suspecting a miracle had taken place, resolved to discover who this remarkable woman was, and apparently concluded his local inquiries having proved fruitless that she must live in Spain. Yet it was not until 1630 that Father Benavides was able to visit Madrid, where he met with the head of the Franciscan order, who, knowing of Mary of Jesus of Agrita, opined that it was probably her. Father Benavides then traveled secretly to Agrita where he interviewed Mary about the conversion of the Jumanos. She told him the part she had played in giving it, giving him by way proof of her visits, the true names of them all, and give an exact description of them and of the habits and military arms of those Indians. In her voyages to Mexico she had seen prodigious seas and vast tracts of land, all of which she gave a perfect account. She had been in some of them by day and in others by night. In some of them she had met with fair weather and others with rain and had seen the Indians on their knees to her praying for a remedy. It was her accurate accounts of Jumano's way of life about which she could not have known anything without visiting them for they were a distant and previously uncontacted tribe which persuaded Father Benavides that she was the woman whom the Jumanos called the Lady in Blue. Mary's bilocations ended the following year, although Geddes says wrongly that they did so in 1623, when the unwelcome celebrity resulting from them, which conflicted with her vows of humility, prompted her to pray for them to stop a divine dispensation that was evidently granted. She remained at the Agrida convent, however, and became, in due course, its abbess, a post which she held with one short interruption until her death in 1665. As a best, she was instrumental in raising funds to have a new convent and church built, 
She also wrote a lengthy biography of the Virgin Mary, which she claimed was dictated to her by the Mother of God. Mary of Jesus of Agrita's bilocations are undoubtedly the most remarkable of their type on record. Her testimony was investigated fully by the Franciscan commissary, her confessor, and a provincial of the order, as well as by Father Benavides, to whom, following the receipt of a letter from the head of the Franciscan order instructing her to reveal all, she gave the detailed account outlined above of her miraculous travels. It was they who concluded that she must have been physically present in Mexico, that she had, in other words, duplicated herself, which went against Mary's own judgment of what had happened, for she doubted that she had done so, preferring to think in her humility that she had been there only in spirit. Each of Mary's ecstatic trances during which her double appeared lasted no more than three hours, which perhaps explains why so many of them, about 500, were necessary, especially as some were of a far shorter duration. Her sudden appearances among the Indians, the shortness of her visits, and her equally sudden disappearances would have been deeply impressive to them, miraculous as they seemed, and must have encouraged them to listen to her words and to adopt her faith. Yet nonetheless, it is very difficult to comprehend how she was understood by the Shumanos when she spoke to them in Spanish or how she understood their native tongue. The solution might be that her double was able to read the thoughts of talking Jumanos while she was able to telepathically channel her thoughts into their minds. In this way, a direct mind-to-mind -mind link would operate when one or other of them was speaking, which would enable a seeming comprehension of the speaking words. The other famous and more recent example of bilocation also involved a woman who similarly duplicated herself on many occasions Yet, her case is different in several respects from that of Mary of Agrita. An examination of its main features will help us to throw further light on this puzzling phenomenon. The woman's name was Emile Sagui. She was French by birth and a schoolmistress by profession. And we have a record of her curious duplications at the time when she was teaching at the Pensionat de Noelke, a small school for daughters of the nobility standing a mile and a half outside the town of Walmar near Riga in modern Latvia. She was then about 32 years of age. Her case was first reported in the 18 August 1883 issue of Light magazine under the title Habitual Apparition of a Living Person. The author is anonymous, although she says that she obtained her information directly from Mademoiselle Julie de Guldenstow, who was one of the pupils at Nuelke during the 18 months, 1845 to 1846, that Mademoiselle Sagui worked there. Blonde and blue-eyed, Mademoiselle Sagui evidently had a pleasant and generally cheerful, if somewhat nervous, disposition. She was bright and well-educated, and her talents as a teacher were above average. Indeed, she was well-liked by her pupils. But she had not been at the school for many weeks before the girls of whom there were 42 began disagreeing about her whereabouts. One pupil would comment, for example, that she had just seen her in the library, while another, having come from the music room, would protest that that was impossible, as she had been with Mademoiselle Sagui in there. When this strange disparity was repeated on several occasions, it began to alarm the girls who brought it to the attention of the other teachers. They, however, said it was impossible for someone to be in two places at the same time, and that the girls were therefore mistaken. Yet the girl's suspicions were entirely substantiated when Mademoiselle Sagui was one day writing on the blackboard in front of a class. To the astonishment and terror of her pupils, a second Mademoiselle Sagui suddenly appeared as if by magic beside her. Dressed in identical clothes and mimicking her actions, although not having any chalk, the double was unable to actually write anything on the board. The resulting screams had the mistress turning around quickly breathless and red-faced to quieten her charges and action that led to the disappearance of her alter ego. Yet despite telling them they had imagined it, the flustered teacher found it impossible to persuade the 13 girls in the class they had not seen two of her. Soon after, continues the anonymous author, one of the pupils, Mademoiselle Antoine de Rangel, having obtained permission with some others to attend Fête Champetre in the neighborhood, and being engaged in completing her toilet, Mademoiselle Sagui had good-naturedly volunteered her aid and was hooking her dress from behind. The young lady, happening to turn around and to look in an adjacent mirror, perceived 
to Mademoiselle Seguise, hooking her dress. The sudden apparition produced so much effect on her that she fainted. But Mademoiselle Seguise double by no means only imitated the actions of the real person, as the following extract makes clear. Sometime when the latter rose from a chair, the figure would appear seated on it. On one occasion, Mademoiselle Segui, being confined to bed with an attack of the influenza, the young lady already mentioned, Mademoiselle de Rangel, was sitting by her bedside, reading to her. Suddenly, the governess became stiff and pale, and seeming as if about to faint. The young lady, alarmed, asked her if she was worse. She replied that she was not, but in a very feeble and languid voice, as a few seconds later, Mademoiselle de Rangel, happening to look around, saw quite distinctly the figure of the governess walking up and down the apartment. Not long afterwards, the pupils were doing embroidery in one of the large downstairs rooms, which had four French windows looking out on the garden. They were seated around a long table and were supervised by another teacher who sat at its head. While they were thus engaged, the girls noticed Mademoiselle Segui come into the garden and begin picking flowers, which she did with her customary brightness and energy. Their supervisor then rose and, excusing herself, left the room. The girls continued working while watching Mademoiselle Segui outside until one of them, happening to look around, noticed with a shriek that another Mademoiselle Segui sat in the chair so recently vacated by her colleague. General astonishment followed, with everyone in the room alternately turning to look open-mouthed at the double, then back at the Emile Segui, who was picking flowers. The two were identical, although the one in the garden the girls saw was now moving about slowly and lackadaisically, as if she was lost in another world. Finally, two of the girls, who were bolder than the rest, went up to the double and touched it. They averred that they did feel a slight resistance, which they likened to that which a fabric of fine muslin or crepe would offer to the touch. One of the two passed close in front of the armchair and actually threw a portion of the figure. The appearance, however, remained after she had done so for some time longer, still seated as before. At last, it gradually vanished. The real Mademoiselle Sagui in the garden then became more animated and resumed picking flowers with her previous zest. When she was later questioned by some of the girls about her replication, Mademoiselle Sagui could only say that she had noticed the absence of her colleague in the room and had thought it might lead to them to neglecting their work. The phenomenon continued under various modifications throughout the whole time that Mademoiselle Sagui retained her situation at Nuelki that is, throughout a portion of the years 1845 and 1846, and in all for about a year and a half. At intervals, however, sometimes intermitting for a week, sometimes for several weeks at a time. It seemed chiefly to present itself when the lady was very earnest or eager in what she was about. It was uniformly remarked that more distinct and material to the sight the double was, the more stiff and languid was the living person, and in proportion as the double faded did the real individual resume her powers. She herself, however, was totally unconscious of the phenomenon. She had first become aware of it only from the reports of others, and she usually detected it by the looks of the person present. She never herself saw the appearance, nor seemed to notice the species of rigid apathy which crept over her at the times it was seen by others. Mademoiselle Segui's double was a spontaneous phenomenon, unwanted and unwilled, and the fact that the woman herself was unable to see it must have been very frustrating to her, particularly as its appearance caused her endless professional difficulties. Indeed, when she was later and regretfully sacked from the Pensionat de Nuelki because worried parents who had heard about the phenomenon from their daughters started taking them away from the school, she revealed she had already been dismissed from 18 other schools for the same reason. This case is undoubtedly one of the most remarkable of its kind. However, it differs from the Mary of Agrita in that being spontaneous, Mademoiselle Segui's consciousness did not transfer itself into her double and because the double never strayed far from Mademoiselle Segui. During the 18 months throughout which my informant had an opportunity of witnessing this phenomenon and hearing of it through others, no example came to her knowledge of the appearance of the figure at any considerable distance as of several miles from the real person. Sometimes it appeared, but not far off, during their walks in the neighborhood, more frequently, however, within doors. Every servant in the house had seen it. It was apparently perceptible to all persons without distinctions of age or sex. Yet when the double arises from someone who is in a trance or meditative state, the consciousness can be transferred to it. 
which enables it to not only become self-aware but to cogitate and speak and to perform actions as if it was the real person. In a mental sense, if not wholly in a physical sense, it therefore becomes that person which allows the subject like the lady in blue in distant Mexico to do what he or she could not do ordinarily. The French explorer Alexander David Neal spent a total of 14 years traveling in Tibet during the early years of the 20th century, where she was able to observe and record many of the Buddhist and occult practices of that country's remarkable people. Her meetings with lamas and hermits revealed to her that many of them developed supernatural powers, even though they themselves did not regard them as supernatural. Rather, they believed that such powers derived from the control of the ordinary but little-known energies. The Tibetans likewise believe in the double or duplicate self, which they hold can, in certain circumstances, separate itself from the physical body. The double may leave the physical body spontaneously, as happened with Emil Sagi, yet those adepts who acquire the necessary powers of concentration can bring it about at will. The double may then reveal itself, if desired, in distant locations. Just as we see in the Neville Goddard story, where he appears before his sister, he did that with will. This technique has important practical applications, as the double may sometimes be sent ahead of a traveler, for example, to alert his hosts of his approach, or to assure them that he is well. While at times of grave personal danger, the double may save his life by luring pursuers into taking the wrong direction, so allowing him to make his escape. In her book, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, 1929, Alexandra David Neal relates how the double of her distant and long overdue servant named Wang Du appeared ahead of him. She was prompted to look out for the young man by a dream she had the previous night. The place where I stood, she said, dominated a valley. I distinctly saw Wang Du. He was dressed exactly as I had seen him in my dream. He was alone and walking slowly up the path that wound up the hill slope. I remarked that he had no luggage with him. And the servant who was next to me answered, Wang Du was walked ahead. The load carriers must be following. We both continued to observe the man. He reached a small chorten or monument made of stones, walked behind it, and did not reappear. As time went by without his reappearing, I inspected the ground around the monument with my field glasses, but discovered nobody. Very much puzzled, I went to two of my servants to search for the boy. I followed their movements with glasses, but no trace was found of Wang Du nor of anybody else. That same day, a little before dusk, the young man appeared in the valley with his caravan. He wore the very same dress and the foreign sun hat which I had seen in my dream and in the morning vision. Alexander David Neal immediately and separately interrogated Wang Du and his companions about where they had spent the night and learned that it was not only at a place so distant that none could have reached the Chorten by daybreak, but that the party had remained together throughout their journey. Hence the real Wang Du had not come ahead, rather his double had and had thereby given Alexandra David Neal notice of the real Wang Du and his party's imminent return. The double was not a subjective vision for it was seen by both her and at least one other servant. However, Alexandra David Neal suggests that the double was a spontaneous manifestation and so had not been consciously willed to appear by Wang Du. A spontaneous duplication may on occasion be brought about by a person wishing himself to be where he is not. Such as might happen, for example, if he is stuck in a traffic jam and yearns to be at home. The following appearance of such a double was witnessed by Peggy Sullivan, who was kind enough to describe what she saw. Her account demonstrates that such remarkable events are happening to ordinary people today, and also that a double originating from someone who is conscious may exhibit more awareness and mentality than perhaps usual. One day in the mid-80s, she writes, I had performed my usual weekday afternoon chores, which were to walk and feed the dogs, prepare our evening meal, and lay the table. Then again, as usual, I put my feet up in the chair by the lounge window and dozed. I awoke to hear my partner's voice. I'm home, dear, and saw him crossing the room towards me. He came over to my chair and bent and kissed me, saying, Oh, that journey. Won't I be glad when I retire? He had to make the return journey from work in the rush hour each weekday, evening, usually reaching home between 6 and 6.30. And he loathed being stuck in the traffic jams, especially in the summer. I jumped up quite flustered. Goodness, I didn't know it was that late. 
I exclaimed. You go and get changed. I'll put the oven on and pour you a drink. I attended to these things and called out. Your drink's poured. After about five minutes and hearing nothing, I looked in the bedroom and bathroom, but he was not to be seen. So I thought he had gone back out to the car for something. I went outside, but there was no car in the drive or garage. Then for no explainable reason, I looked at the clock. The time said 5.40, at least 20 minutes before he could possibly arrive back. He was not at home. He eventually came home at 6.15. She remarked that she awoke to see her ersatz partner at about 5.30 p.m. when he was in reality encountering the first heavy traffic on his drive home, that he appeared entirely lifelike and normal. She definitely felt his kiss on her cheek, which suggests interestingly that his double had a discernible solidity. She rose from her chair, and when he turned from her so that she saw his back view as he left the room, it was only later she realized that their two dogs had not come frisking into the room with him as they usually did. However, on going out to the kitchen, she found them waiting in the hall for him where they usually sat, although she thought at the time they were waiting for him to come out of the bedroom. The appearance of the double in this case has some unique features, the most important being that the man from whom it originated, Peggy's partner Nigel, was quite conscious when it manifested. He was driving a car, and that unlike the duplicate of Mademoiselle Sagi, his double was able to speak and respond to Peggy's suggestions. It also appeared some miles away from the real Nigel, and then having left the room apparently to get changed, it completely disappeared. The manifestation was brief, went unnoticed by the couple's dogs and served no apparent purpose. Nigel says that he was not specifically thinking of Peggy at the time, which suggests that his double was spontaneously generated by his desire or wish to be out of the traffic and at home. Thus, you can, it seems, really be in two places at the same time. The generation of a duplicate, whether consciously or unconsciously, has similarities to but also differences from the phenomenon known as astral projection. The latter is the name given to the exteriorization of the astral or etheric or spiritual body from the physical body, which may allow it to visit distant sites. Astral projection, which I've discussed on several episodes through a variety of different authors, can either occur spontaneously, as it may, is always accompanied by a separation of the consciousness from the physical body, which has led some researchers to suggest that astral travel is really mind-body separation and not the splitting of some mysterious spiritual component which incorporates the mind from the body. The astral body, unlike the double, is normally quite invisible to others, although it can on occasion be seen. Its perceived form by the person to whom it happens also varies. One astral traveler may report that he had his human shape, whereas another will say that his shape was quite different, with various geometric forms or even points of light being given the commoner alternatives. The double by contrast is always, as its name suggests, a duplicate of the real person, and it is always visible to others. The astral body can easily penetrate matter, and so pass unhindered through walls and doors, which suggests that it is entirely non-physical, whereas the double has a degree of physicality and thus cannot behave like a ghost despite being able to appear supernaturally out of thin air and to vanish in an equally astonishing way. Most astral travelers also report they cannot communicate with others while out of the body or affect their environment in any way. Yet the conscious duplicate is not so circumscribed. It is able to have conversations with those around it and can move or otherwise manipulate solid objects. The double is therefore a three-dimensional entity in its own right, whereas the astral body, although conscious, is not. The composition of the double is as yet a mystery. The phenomenon, quite simply, is so rare that no sample has been taken from a double's body and analyzed. However, it may be that the gauze-like extrusion known as ectoplasm, which we hear about in Ghostbusters, which is produced by trance-like mediums and which can, on occasion, organize itself into human-like spirit forms, has the same or related structure. Ectoplasm is a physical substance, yet unusually light in weight and microscopic examination of it appears to show a cellular organization. It is usually extruded from the mouth, the nose, and or other orifices of the medium's body, 
But while it seems to be a suitable substrate from which the double might be formed, the fact remains that no extruded ectoplasm has ever, at least as far as I know, organized itself into a double of the medium from which it comes, whereas we might suppose that it would naturally tend to assume his or her form. In this respect, it is interesting to note that whereas most modern religions maintain that our physical bodies are inhabited by immaterial souls, which gives no basis for the production of a semi-physical replica, certain pagan peoples had a very different view of our inner structure. Both the ancient Germans and Scandinavians, for example, believed that the soul or second ego could leave the body and take up a semi-independent existence either as a double of the person or in an animal form, that it was partly physical in composition and that it could function in much the same way as the person or the animal type into which it manifested. The Scandinavians referred to it as the filja, which means the follower or the second. The filja could be injured or even killed, the injury it suffered simultaneously affecting the real person, while its death resulted in his or her death as well. Although the astral body can be willed to leave the physical body, its separation usually occurs spontaneously, if at all, and then typically only once in a person's lifetime. Some people are good at it and they practice and they can do it on a regular basis. Such may also be true of the double, but I believe in the fourth density environment we're going to see more and more of it as it's going to happen more and more spontaneously. And I would love to hear in the comments about your experiences with this phenomenon. But because duplication is rarely partnered by a transfer of consciousness, and because the double is often but not always invisible to the person for whom it originates, then he or she will only know of its generation when told by others that it has been seen. This is particularly true of those cases where the double appears at a distant place. Another interesting example of such a one-off duplication happened to a young married woman named Henrietta Piggott Carlton in September of 1873. At the time, she was holidaying with her husband at her father's shooting lodge in County Tyrone. A family friend, Captain M, was also staying with them, and on the day in question, Mrs. Piggott Carlton accompanied the captain when he went fishing in the nearby river. My husband had some engagement, but my father walked a short way with us, she writes. He never cared to have me long away from him, and upon turning back, remarked as he left me, don't get too far from home. The pair nonetheless walked about four miles along the river bank before the captain stopped to fish and Miss Piggott Carlton sat down to read the novel she had brought with her. All seemed perfect until suddenly glancing up, the lady caught sight of an advancing storm cloud. I saw we were in for a drenching, thought how it would fidget my father, and wished myself back at home with all my heart. In a few minutes, the storm burst upon us. Shelter there was next to none, and as soon as the deluge had somewhat abated, we made for the lodge, looking as though... We had barely escaped from a watery grave. Captain M and Mrs. Piggott Carlton had almost reached the lodge when they were suddenly and unexpectedly met by a search party consisting of the lady's father, her husband, and several employees of the former, which surprised and puzzled her. Her feelings turned to annoyance when her father next berated her for foolhardiness, and on returning with them to the lodge, she retired to her room somewhat angry. The next day, she continues, I boldly entered upon the subject with my father, hoping free discussion might help to disperse his disquietude. He told me that some little time after his return from the river, he sat down to read with his back to the western window, that suddenly a shadow fell across the page, that turning his head, he saw the standing of the half-open window, my arms resting upon the push-down sash that he had, Halloa, back already that I made no reply, but suddenly stepped down off the low outer window sill and disappeared, that he put a mark in the book, got up, and looked out the window, not seeing me. He first went to the servants and asked if I had come in at the back door, and then went out onto the little terrace before the lodge and looked around for me, that he suddenly caught sight of the coming storm cloud, that his bewilderment changed to uneasiness, and that my husband just then, coming in, they speedily started a search." Mrs. Piggott Carlton perhaps rightly surmises that the appearance of her double was caused by her wishing with all her heart to be at home, while its objectivity and solidity seem to be assured by the fact that it cast a shadow. She had, of course, no idea that she had generated a double until told that she had, yet the distance four miles that it manifested from her is considerably greater than those achieved by the double of Emile Segui 
although this was probably because Mademoiselle Segui had no desire or need to be elsewhere at those times. However, the double's apparent inability to attain full physicality is partly belied by the story told of the French knight Walter of Berbic, who flourished A.D. 1200, a relative of Henry, Duke of Louvain, whose double is said to have jousted with great success in a tournament while he stopped en route to the event to say mass in a chapel. If true, it suggested that on a certain exceptional occasions, the double can achieve solidity equal to that of a human body. This may even have happened in the case of Nigel mentioned earlier. It is usual for those who have achieved uh, astral separation, like those who have had a near-death experience, to see their comatose physical body and the surrounding environment before moving away from them as may happen to another place. The opposite is sometimes encountered with the phenomenon of the double, whereby the person from whom it manifests may see it and thus seemingly his own self. Such an apparition is described by William Wordsworth in his poem Peter Bell the Tale. Close by a break of flowering firs, above it shivering aspens play. He sees an unsubstantial creature, his very self in form and feature, not four yards from the broad highway. This is hardly surprising, a disturbing experience for those to whom it happens, and one that has over the years acquired a dreadful reputation, being said to augur the death of the person concerned. There are certainly cases on record when such a premonition came true to the extent of death immediately following, such as has happened to the French foreign legionnaire described by the writer Wellesley Tudor Pole, who, when seemingly beyond speech, he half rose from the pillow in the sand where he had tried to take refuge from the sun and cried out in broken French, Why there is myself coming to meet me? How wonderful! Then he fell back and died, and we reported the incident on reaching Busada the next day. However, seeing oneself in this way does not invariably mean imminent death, as it did for Peter Bell. The German poet Wolfgang Goth once saw his own double while out riding, yet oddly it was not his exact duplicate as it wore clothes of a different style and cut to his own. Goth did not die as he had perhaps feared, although some eight years later, while out for another ride, he suddenly realized that he was traveling along the same path and in the same direction as his double and that he was wearing identical clothes although not from choice but by accident he had thus seen his double in the guise of himself from the future which i think is in some cases we're actually witnessing our future self or a past self and there are time slips that occur where there is some kind of time slip or the environment that we're in and we're seeing or other people are seeing us and we are still in the linear time progression conscious within it so I started to see if there had been research or scientific studies done on this, at least at a minimum, you know that people have showed up at hospitals and said, hey, I have bilocated. And there is actual incredible research being done in human neuroscience on this. In an article, The Bilocated Mind, New Perspectives on Self-Localization and Self-Identification from human frontiers in human neuroscience there is a ton of information on studies that have been done does the human mind allow for self-locating at more than one place at a time evidence from neurology cognitive neuroscience and experimental psychology suggests that mental bilocation is a complex but genuine experience occurring more frequently than commonly thought in this article they distinguish between different components of bilocated self-representation, self-localization in two different places at the same time, self-identification with another body, reduplication of first-person perspective, and they argue that different forms of mental bilocation may result from the combination of these components. In daily life, the self is typically tied to one place, of course, at a given point in time, and this place coincides with the body. As Husserl puts it, I do not have the possibility of distancing myself from my body, nor it from me. Self-experience, however, is not always constrained by the body. Empirical research into self-related disorders and full-body illusions demonstrates that the spatial unity between body and self can be temporarily suspended for seconds and more seldom minutes. Neurological and psychiatric patients may experience themselves to be localized, at and to see from a location outside their physical body. Blank and Moore researched this in 2005. 
A similar experience might be experimentally induced in healthy subjects using mirrors or simple virtual reality devices, according to Loggenhager in his two studies um, in 2007 and 2009. Where does the self localize during such experiences? Outside the bodily borders, at the location of the physical body, does the human mind allow for locating at more than one place at the same time? Based on the concept of minimal phenomenal selfhood or MPS, Blank and Metzinger, our contention is that mental bilocation, i.e. localization of the self at two distinct places at the same time, is not a single perceptual experience, but can be broken down into different components. Self-localization in two different places at the same time, self-identification with another body and reduplication of first-person perspective. Different forms of mental bilocation may result from the combination of these components. This article is amazing. It discusses three instances of mental bilocation in which the above-mentioned components appear differently present. Um, they have something called hyatoscopy, virtual presence, and perspective taking. And although mental bilocation in its complete form is only experienced during hyatoscopy, incomplete forms of mental bilocation can be experienced during immersion in virtual reality and in everyday life during spatial perspective taking and in meditation. And according to this study, incidences of bilocation are reported in many different cultures at many different times, and they propose that these reports are rooted in the complex experiences of being mentally at two places at the same time, an experience which is more frequent than commonly thought and might play an important role in the construction of a shared space. So I looked up hyatoscopy. Hyatoscopy is the encounter with one's double, according to a study all the way back by Menninger and Lerkenthal in 1935. It is a rare multimodal illusory experience characterized by the reduplication of one's own body and self. Blank and Moore researched this in 2005. As in other forms of autoscopic phenomena, such as autoscopic hallucination during hyatoscopy, the patient sees a double of herself in the extrapersonal space. This double, however, is not a mere image or visual hallucination. The self can be experienced as being at the position of physical body, body-centered frame of reference, and simultaneously or in rapid alternation at the position of the reduplicate body in the extrapersonal space. Altered body-centered frame of reference. This was established by Lopez and Blank in 2007. Self-location and first-person visual perspective may alternate between an embodied and a disembodied location, and it might be difficult for the subject to decide where the self is actually localized, according to Brueger in 2002. As illustrated by the following example, the patient may indeed experience to be at both positions at the same time. The patient has the immediate impression as if she were seeing herself from behind herself, she felt as if she were standing at the foot of my bed and looking down at myself. Yet, the patient also has the impression to see from physical, visual, spatial perspective. Asked at which of these two positions she thinks herself to be, she answered that I am at both positions at the same time. Hyatoscopic experiences are often associated with changes in the awareness of one's body. Patients may, for example, report abnormal vestibular sensations such as abnormal lightness or hollowness of the body, which may feel just like an empty shell after the chick is hatched. Lukianowicz in 1958. With increasing body depersonalization, there is an increase in personalization of the illusory double to the point that the patient may wonder whether it is the physical body or rather the reduplicated body which contains the real self. Not only self-localization, first-person perspective, but also self-identification may therefore be experienced as a split in two parts, according to Brugger in 1994. Hyatoscopy of neurological origin has been related to pathological activity patterns primarily localized at temporoparietal junction, according to Blank and Moore. In healthy subjects, a similar duplication of the self with two distinct and active roles can be experienced during REM sleep, when the dreamer has both the role of the chief character and that of the observer or plays different protagonist roles in the dream, according to an amazing article by Sokogna and Bassanelli. As hyatoscopy, these situations may involve oscillations of first-person perspective, 
and uncertainty relative to perception, feelings, and emotions, according to Siogena in 2011. Because REM sleep involves considerable deafferentiation and reduction of incoming peripheral vestibular information, this supports the implication of the vestibular cortex situated in that study. Now, some of that might be confusing, but I find it fascinating that it's been researched to that level. A common metric of the quality of virtual environment is the degree to which the virtual environment creates in the user the illusion of presence, the subjective experience of being in one place when physically situated in another, according to Heater in 92 and Whitmer and Singer in 98. Similar feelings of presence at distant places may arise during teleoperations in telepresence video conferencing and during immersion in cyber therapy settings. Telepresence and virtual presence are generally thought to imply a departure from the physical environment and an arrival in the mediated environment. Little, however, is known about the temporal and spatial dynamics of these self-localization processes. May individuals perceive themselves localized here and there at the same time? That's the question I asked at the beginning. To investigate variations of presence over time, Wismuth employed a two-dimensional continuous measurement paradigm based on handheld sliders. Now, in this study, participants were exposed to a virtual roller coaster simulation. In two separate rides, participants were asked to use the slider to report second by second on a scale from zero to 100, to what extent they felt located in the immediate physical environment, and to what extent they felt located in the mediated virtual environment. The results revealed that participants were able to integrate both localizations and distributed their presences in both realities. 30 seconds after the onset of the presentation, they localized themselves in both the immediate and mediated environment. And most noteworthy, the findings indicated that an almost perfect inverse relationship between self-localization in the two environments over time, the stronger self-localization in the mediated environment at a certain point in time, the weaker the feeling of being localized in the immediate environment at the corresponding time during the other ride. Have you ever played a video game and felt like you were actually there? When at the same time, you're also sitting there playing the video game. It's kind of the same concept that's being discussed in these different studies. Converging evidence from the field of social neuroscience suggests that people relate knowledge of their own body to understand other people's behavior. Accordingly, understanding others' actions, intentions, and emotions have been proposed to rely on a mechanism of embodied simulation. And using a spontaneous motor paradigm, Thoreau investigated whether individuals also embody others' localizations, mentally locating themselves in the position of other bodies during social interaction. Participants observed a life-sized virtual tightrope walker leaning to her left or right on a rope. In a first experimental test, they interacted spontaneously with the tightrope walker by leaning when she was leaning. In a second, in a third experiment, they were instructed to lean when the tightrope walker was leaning by either imagining their body in the same position as the tightrope walker or imagining their body at their actual body position in a mirror reflection. Interaction tilt patterns were indistinguishable from the rotational tilt patterns at both the motor and neural level, suggesting during interaction participants spontaneously located themselves in the walker's body position. So when you're watching somebody play football, you ever, um, or, or wrestling or some sporting event, you ever find your body moving around as if you're in the game? Something my grandfather used to always do. We'd watch football and a running back would have the ball and I could see him just squirming in his seat. And he said, I feel like I'm running the ball. And as we become identified with more and more people in a fourth density environment, we will start to localize our consciousness and we will also be able to see and feel what's happening in other people's bodies. So this bilocation phenomenon is fascinating. And I promise you, I could sit and recite a number of different things why this is happening, why bilocation is happening. And there is a lot more to be found, but it's fascinating that neuroscience is actually studying this phenomenon because it's a real phenomenon. A number of patients report this happening with psychiatrists and psychologists, and it has been studied in a lab. So if you found yourself in two different places, or if people have reported you seeing you in different places, and this 
starts to happen more and more, I think it's a common phenomenon. It's an understanding, a movement to the oneness and a greater freedom that we have within our bodies where we can shift our consciousness to multiple places at a time. I believe with the new light photon, which is much more complicated and complex, we will have this ability and it will increase and we will get used to it. But I would love to get your perspective. Have you ever bilocated? Of course, I know many of you have astrally projected and there is an element of bilocation that is involved in that. But as we discussed earlier, it can be different. So I, have you ever seen yourself? Has anybody seen you physically in another place? Or have you seen someone else that was in physically two places at the same time? It's a fascinating question. I would love to know about your personal experiences with it. And if it is happening, you're not going crazy. It's a real thing. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.